it's been probably 15 years. I don't think I've ever really initiated a conversation unless somebody has already kind of initiated some curiosity with me. It's, it, even when you watch Jesus, he didn't really start a whole lot of conversations. It seemed like people actually went after him. And then he, even when they would ask him a question, he would just sort of deal with it very quickly. And then he would sort of back up. And it seemed like they couldn't keep from continuing to go at him. I found that's the same way in my life. People will ask a question about, um, you know, how come you and Cheryl don't seem to fight that much? And, and then I tell them that we do fight, but, um, but yeah, not as much as we used to. And then they ask, well, how? How do you not fight? And I remember one guy asked me that question. I said, Joe, for me to tell you that, I'd have to be really honest about my relationship with Jesus. And he said, that's why I asked you. And so at that point, then the conversation's supernatural because he's literally asked me to tell him about Jesus. A few months ago, I had a party at my house and we had uh, a neighbor that was my wife's real estate agent, uh, kind of head broker at her office. And uh, just a lot of friends hanging around, some of uh, his friends, some folks that were part of our church, uh, just kind of mingling together really well. And uh, Matt came over and he, uh, he just said, hey, Barry and I, that's his wife, were talking the other night and, and we just talked about how we don't have a whole lot to offer our kids. His kids were now, I think, six, seven, and eight, and I, they must have been bringing up conversations about God. And he just said, I realized that um, I have nothing to offer them. That, and actually goes, I, I think I might be spiritually bankrupt. And, uh, and I said, well, you should work on that. And he said, I'm trying to. And then we just went back to the party. And, uh, and then it was probably four months later, just a few weeks ago, that uh, I actually walked into his real estate office and uh, he looked a little bit sort of bummed out and I, I said, what's up, Matt? And he, he goes, remember that spiritual bankruptcy thing I brought up? I said, yeah. And I said, you know, like, you're not making a lot of headway on that? And he, he goes, uh, no. He goes, is there something that you could do to help me figure this out? And um, so, yeah, so we've been talking now about God pretty naturally. I think it was assumed that Christians would live such uh, beautiful lives that people would actually go after them, knock on their door. Um, call them, email them, whatever, uh, to try to get some help with their life. So I just wait till people uh, move towards us and then I just speak openly and honestly as somebody that's, that's just trying to figure it out too. So I'm not the answer man, um, but I am somebody that's trying to follow this real person that really makes a difference in absolutely everything in my life. And so it's easy to talk about that part of Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Man, this is unbelievable. We got 300 people here today. Um, my name's Paul Tenhaken, and my real job is uh, not putting on events like this. I'm the CEO of a company called Click Rain, a uh, digital marketing agency. And um, God put on my heart a couple years ago to put an event together like this, and uh, I kind of just ignored it for several years. Uh, and then ultimately, um, couple people in my life said, you need to do that. I think there's an appetite for this. And so we, we kicked around some names and we said, let's call this thing a God as CEO event and let's have a free breakfast. And we threw it on Facebook and now there's 300 people here who either are interested in the topic or who want a free breakfast. So <laughs> I know there's some, a lot of Dutch people here, so there's, uh, <laughs> there might be a little bit of the latter. Um, but I just, I'm super humbled and overwhelmed that all these people are here. And uh, as the gentleman in the video just said, he's, he said, I'm not the answer man. Uh, I am a marketing schlep. Uh, I am not a pastor. I am not a preacher. Um, I'm just a business guy uh, that God has uh, worked in our business in some ways that uh, we wanted to share with you, with you all today. And um, two guys that were kind of the impetus uh, for this, amongst many others, were uh, these two guys. I'll call them the two Randys. Uh, two, two Randys that I've got to know over the years. Uh, the guy on the left, Randy McCoy. Randy was one of my first partners at ClickRain. And uh, I remember when uh, the company was really small. Um, we were two people. And Randy, we, we had a meeting. And Randy says, hey, what, you know, what sort of culture are we building here? I'm like, well, there's two of us, so <laughs> like, we like show up and we high five each other and then we get to work. I mean, what do you what do you want? 
And it was only until years later that I started to really appreciate what he was really poking at there. And then the, the second Randy, Randy on the uh, right, Randy Reese, uh, Randy's a guy I got to know through uh, Vantage Point 3, a, a, a curriculum, Bible study curriculum I went through. Uh, uh, sadly, Randy passed away about a year ago, but the time that I got to know Randy, he would often say this to me when I talked to him about my business. He'd say, God is up to something at your business, Paul. Um, that was kind of his go-to phrase, God is up to something. And he's like, when he would tell me that, it was just the push I think I needed to, to pull together an event like this and, and to share what I'm going to share with you guys today. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, ClickRain is, is my real job. Uh, we're a marketing technology agency. Uh, here in Sioux Falls. We have 35 employees. The oldest employee uh, is 42 or 43. I think he's here, Eric Ellison, old man. <laughs> so so he's, he, he gets the ARP card at our company, but we're a young company. Uh, and I, I show this slide very humbly, but we've had the opportunity or the pleasure or the honor of winning a lot of awards uh, over the last several years. And a lot of the awards we've won have been for our culture, uh, the culture that we built, uh, the way that we treat our people, some, some innovative benefits we offer. Uh, and the only reason I show this is because sometimes third-party validation is, is good. It's, it's, it's sometimes nice for someone to say, hey, looks like you're doing something right from the outside. We're doing more things wrong than we're doing right. Don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, we fall down a lot, um, but there's a few things that have been working. And so as the company has grown, um, and I would like to just pause real quick. If you guys want seats, there are seats up front. So feel free to come on up right now. There's chairs here, here, here. So don't feel like you're distracting the talk. Um, but as we've won these awards and, and, and we win these awards, people will say, you know, what, what do you attribute that to? What's, kind of, what's the secret sauce? What's working there? Um, and you go through your list in your head and and selfishly, if you're a business owner or you're a successful executive, you're like, well, I'm me. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good at what I do. You know, I'm, um, no one would say that. But deep down, we're like, I'm a pretty good lawyer. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I, I got a great team. Um, I got my MBA or my doc. You know, when I got my doctorate, it's probably why we're really crushing it because I'm pretty smart. Uh, you know, market conditions have been right, or we have a great business climate in South Dakota. Um, we're really good at what we do. That's the reason this stuff is happening. And, and quite honestly, those, those aren't true. I mean, the, the, the thing that I tell people is I say, God is the CEO of our company. I mean, if, if I'm sorry to let you down, I wish there was some really grandiose answer, but it's that God's the CEO of our company. And that usually allows me to unpack, well, what, you know, what does that mean, you know, to have God as a CEO of your company? Um, and so I want to I share with you a story um, about a lady that I unfortunately didn't have a chance to meet when I was in the Dominican in 2011. Uh, our church was organizing a trip to the Dominican Republic uh, to do a mission trip, church mission trip. And we were having a heck of a time getting seven or eight people to commit to go on this trip. And for all the reasons, we all declined that stuff. I don't want to burn my vacation on something like that. And um, I, can't be, I have a state wrestling tournament when it's going on, so, but you know, that's more important and all this stuff. And I had had click rain for a couple of years and had the flexibility in my schedule. And I'm like, you know what, I, I should probably do this. So I kind of begrudgingly went on this trip with kind of not the greatest heart, but I'm like, yeah, I'll do this. And we were working on a house for this pastor um, outside of La Romana in the Dominican Republic. And about day four, we're like, hey, we'd love to meet your wife. You know, where's your wife? And he was a Haitian pastor serving in the Dominican to the Haitian people. And, and in Creole, you know, the guy says through a translator, he's like, well, she'd love to come, but she's got, a, she's got an abscess tooth. And the tooth, the pain is so great in this tooth. She almost has vertigo and, and can't even stand up and it throbs and it's just, it's terrible. So she just lays in bed. He's like, but it's, it's $70 to take care of this tooth. You know, and I'm like, $70? It's like, I'm, I'm, I got 120 in my back pocket, like right now. And I started thinking about, man, um, my focus is on building a company and winning awards 
and growing a business and making money and saving for retirement and having a second car. And here's a lady that won't need 70 bucks so she can get out of bed because her tooth is, is rotting. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I'm gonna come back to that story in a little bit and tell you how that all ties in. So kind of what I wanna talk about today is, is I wanna give you guys five reasons that you should go out of here and make God the CEO of your company. And if you're not a business owner, which a lot of you in the room aren't, he needs to be the CEO of your department, he needs to be the CEO of your house, he needs to be the CEO of whatever you have authority over uh, for the reasons we're gonna talk about today. So first, by way of, this is really a fascinating way to look at your life. If you wanna really break down your life into data, we do a lot of data, nerdy stuff at ClickRain. Uh, between the ages of 20 and 65, there's about 395,000 hours in your life. Figure that um, you sleep eight hours, eight hours a night, which for those of you who don't have kids, you do that. Uh, I've, he I've heard it's awesome, you know. So you back out that, you got 260 hours left during that time. Biggest chunk of that time is gonna be spent here. This is what you, this is what you average per day, about nine hours a day at work. And so about over a third of your life, between 20 and 65 of your waking hours, is gonna be spent working. Which you can either look at it, that really sucks. Or you can look at it as a huge opportunity. And if God is not present in this big piece of the pie, you know his church isn't on here, or service, or mission work, because it's such a small slice, it doesn't even make the chart. So if you're compartmentalizing that and saying, well, Church is my, is my God time. Well, that's a, that's a small fraction of your life. It needs to be present here. So here are the five things we're going to talk about. Uh, scripture commands it. People want it. Uh, the marketplace needs it so bad. Uh, others are doing it, and you can do it. And I want to start with just looking at a few Scripture passages that... When I look at this topic, I kind of go back to a few different passages. And the first one is, is from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8.18. Uh, and this says, uh, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Okay? It's not your MBA or your doctorate or the South Dakota business climate or the great tax. It's, it's, there's only one reason you're even remotely successful. And, and if you make over 30 grand, you are way successful. You're in the top, I don't know what it is, 5% of earners in the world or whatever that stat is. So you're remotely, you're, you're very successful, even if you make 30 grand, right? Um, second, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. That gift is not just gifts as we think of, well, I'm gonna go to the Dominican. My gift is uh, empowering people in the workplace to be bold in your faith. Your, may, your gift may be being a lawyer. Your gift may be being a greeter at Walmart. Okay? Your gift may be you know, working as a landscaper or whatever. Um, you need to use whatever gift you have. That's been given to you. That's the talent God has given you. And he's saying, how are you using that? How are you multiplying that? Joshua 1.9. This is, this is one of my favorite passages. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Quite often when I say the God is CEO stuff to people, they're like, man, aren't you, aren't you kind of worried about being sued or like offending people or, well, quite honestly, I'm not, you know? And there are people in other parts of the world that are getting their, their head shot off for being Christians. And, and my biggest concern is someone's gonna sue me because we talk about God at our office. It's like, that's, <laughs> that, bring it on. I mean, that's nothing. So don't be terrified of that stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't say it in Scripture to um, you know, profess the name of God only when you're not going to offend someone or only when it doesn't make it uncomfortable for people. If it is, you need to show me where that is. That's, 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 not, that's not how it works. We use this verse a lot at Click Rain. It's hanging around a few places in our office. Uh, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart is working for the Lord, not for human masters. Okay? Not for your boss, not for your wife not for the market, um, you're working for God. And lastly, if this, if this isn't somewhat foreshadowing of our current climate, I don't know what is, but 
But understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. There's a lot of that in the marketplace, a lot of that. Uh, I see it a lot. I, I am this in many ways. I, I, I am this guy. Scripture says avoid people like me, okay? So we need God in the marketplace and Scripture commands it. And so kind of a summary to this is your work, it's really of no value unless God is in your work. If God's not in your work and you're not glorifying God through your work, there's not much value in your work. So secondly, um, people want to have God in the workplace. They do. They do. I'm convinced of that. We, at ClickRain, we have this uh, employee engagement software. We just started using it. It's been fascinating because it's pointed out all the stuff where we need to improve, which has been very eye-opening. It's also pointed out the stuff that we're doing well. Uh, and so our employees can give us anonymous feedback on different areas of the business. And one thing that continually comes up is they talk about this faith family work. I support and believe in this value and I'm thankful to be part of a place that follows through in this. Faith family work in that order. That's one of the top things that attracted me to Click Rain. Uh, having time outside of work for God and family is very important to me. I was so attracted to faith family work in that order when applying. It's so cool to get hired and actually see a company in action that doesn't just talk the talk but walks the walk. People want to work for a company that has strong values. They do. And if people say, well, do you, do you only hire Christians at your company? Absolutely not. But when we interview people, we say, here's our company values, and this is our company mission statement, and God is in it. So you have to be comfortable working for a company that believes this. This is what the company believes. So I don't care what your belief system is, but you gotta work for, you're gonna be working for a Christian company. Uh, so all the cards are on the table on the, on the front. So that, of all the things, we're, we're doing several things wrong that we're working on as a company, but organizational fit, meaning the degree with which employees feel like the culture and the values match their own, we rank the highest on that in our company more than anything else, more than pay, more than uh, meaningful work, all this other stuff. Um, and so people want this. Your people want it. Um, I'm going to pick on my friend Paul. Paul's right here. Wave. You can wave, Paul. Yeah. Paul's an unbelievable web developer, but even a more unbelievable young man. And I, I went out to lunch with Paul a while back, and, and he was just like, you know, I'm, I kind of feel like just punching the ones and zeros and making websites, it's not really fulfilling me as much as I, I'd like to. And I said, you know what you need to do, man? And I know, I know he's a man of faith. I said, we've never had a Bible study. Why don't you just start a Bible study? You know, and I know that would mean a lot to you. And who knows, maybe there's a couple people at the company who would want this. So Paul, he's like, yeah, I think I'll try that. So he gets back, he sends out an email to our company, 35 people, and um, he gets 14 emails back from people. Be like, yeah, sign me up, sign me up. So 40% of our company was, was hungry for this. It just took him to, to, to run with it. And for him to have the permission to say, yeah, you should do this, go for it. Pe the people wanted it, they just weren't, didn't have a venue by which to express it. And this, this good looking man too is running the camera right in the back there. So if, there he is, yeah. <laughs> he's, very, he's very excited about the study. <laughs> uh, the marketplace needs it. Okay, the marketplace needs it tremendously. I wanna share with you a video right now by uh, Chick-fil-A, it's one of my favorite videos, and every time I watch it, it reminds me how bad the marketplace uh, needs God.
So for Chick-fil-A to put out that video, uh, they, actually, they obviously see their restaurants as, and this is my words, not theirs, but their churches. These people who are coming into the church of Chick-fil-A each time, they have needs, they have issues, uh, they have worries, they have concerns, they have struggles. And um, God can be present in that marketplace at the church of Chick-fil-A to help these people. And that's, uh, some people will talk about click rain in our staff, and I, I call it, click rain is, is currently, it's my mission field. It's my, my mission field is my company. So most people wouldn't think of their company as their mission field, but if you start thinking of it that way, you look at everybody, that annoying coworker or that client that just gives you just anxiety every time they call, who knows what their story is? And, and how can you be God to them in the marketplace through that interaction? On the center of all your tables was a book. Um, and someone at your table can take that book home. But that book was written by this guy, and his name's Kent. And Kent, um, some of you know the story of Kent. But I, I, Kent came into my life about two years ago. I was getting gas over at West and 12th Street. And this guy uh, stumbled up to me, and he has COPD and Parkinson's. And he was coughing and shaking, and he's like, sir, I, I could really use a ride. Uh, I need a ride to the Social Security office to get my disability check. And so I kind of sized him up. I'm like, well, he's like 60, so I could take him if something happened here. So it's like, <laughs> get in, buddy. So he gets in. So anyway, he gets in, and, and we give him a ride, and that ride turned into uh, a whole afternoon that we spent together because I had to wait for him because the line at the Social Security office was really long. And that turned into breakfast the next day because he had gotten kicked out of his house that night. Uh, he was homeless, and that turned into us trying to find him a place, and that turned into him working at Click Rain as our garbage emptier. And m m more than that, our just people distractor. He'd just kind of walk around the office and talk to all our people. And, <laughs> and Kent had a, had a lifelong dream of publishing his book of poetry. He had poetry. So several people on my team took photos, uh, helped edit his poetry. Uh, did layout work, and we published that book of poetry for him. Uh, and then he unexpectedly passed away last October, and his dream is just to get his poetry out to people. So it would mean a lot if someone took that book home. Um, but the point there is the marketplace. There are Kents walking up and down. There are Kents walking past this place right now on A Street. Uh, and, and the PD, I know there's some guys with the police force here. They can attest to this. There's Kents everywhere. We, as business owners and as business people, we have an ability to have impact on them. We can give them a job for $10 an hour emptying our garbages. We can give them significance. We can give them purpose. We can witness to them. And we can use the positions we've been given as employers, as employees, for God. Others are doing this. So sometimes you feel, um, at least I do, that you're on a little bit of an island when you say, well, God's my CEO. I wish there were more businesses doing that. Um, the good news is there are. We just don't know about all of them. And um, I was at the gym a couple weeks ago, um, and this dude is doing pull-ups in front of me, and he's got an Interstate's battery shirt on. And on the back of his shirt, it's the Interstate's logo, and it says, our purpose to glorify God and to enrich lives as we deliver the most trustworthy source of power. And I'm like, do you work at Interstates? He's like, yeah. I'm like, that's your purpose statement of your company? Like the big Interstate battery? He's like, yeah. He's like, it's a great company, man. Joe Gibbs, and it's, it's an unbelievable company. And I was like, wow. That was encouraging for me to hear that and to see that. Um, so get your batteries in Interstates. OK, great place. <laughs> um, second, um, Tyson Foods. I want to show you a video from the, the CEO, Donnie Smith, who Donnie just retired at the end of the year. Tyson Foods, a great company, great faith-friendly culture. And uh, this was their CEO's perspective that he would roll down within their company regarding uh, uh, faith at work. I believe God intends for every one of us to live every minute of every day filled with and empowered by His Holy Spirit. But so many of us in the workplace compartmentalize our faith by some crazy idea that there's a difference between sacred work and secular work. And there's a higher calling for sacred work than there is for secular work. I don't find that in the Bible. And so I don't view life that way. I think, 
I think God intends for me to live every minute of every day filled with and empowered by His Spirit. And so there's not supposed to be a church Donnie and a see at the grocery store Donnie and a in New York with investors Donnie and a at work Donnie. There's just Donnie. Wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, 1 Corinthians 10 31 says, do all that you do to bring honor to God. You know, worship is maybe thought of as worth-ship. How do we praise God for, for what He's worth, right? How do we give Him honor? So, yes, worshiping, reading our Bible, praying, praising, singing, those are all acts of worship, but anything we do that gives honor to God is an act of worship. So I believe that when I go to work every day, and I do my work to give Him honor, that's an act of worship. My work can be worship because I do it to honor Him. Think about this. I'm making great food and making a difference to honor God. That's worship. I have three kids under 12, so we're helping them tremendously honoring <laughs> with that because... We have Tyson chicken nuggets probably three times a week at our house, but uh, they actually have uh, great perspective by Donnie. Uh, there is the, the Tyson Center for Faith and Spirituality at the Walton School of Business at the University of Arkansas, so they're actually walking the talk even further, helping to equip uh, graduates with how do they live out their faith in the workplace through the Walton College of Business. Uh, and now you may, you know, may, everyone knows the Sam Walton name, and you're like, well, how does, how does that tie in? Well, kind of in researching that, I came across the, um, the current CEO of Walmart. Uh, and I came across this video by him on his perspective of, of faith at work. Worship is knowing who God is and responding appropriately. And that shouldn't happen just on a Sunday morning. It should happen every day. And so I think that, that idea of praying in a constant manner an unceasing manner and having that connection is the right idea. You should be yourself at work just like you are at home and everywhere else. And so if you're a person of faith, it only makes sense that you should exhibit characteristics consistent with your faith and when and where appropriate talk about your faith so that people know who you are. Um, individuals at work should express who they are. We, we want the whole person to be there. That's the best way to improve the performance of the company. In my case, it happens to include my faith, and I don't always get it done. Um, interruptions and distractions and bad days and things happen for sure. But I feel most rewarded and fulfilled in my work when that connection has been stronger, regardless of the hour or the day of the week. So I thought that was pretty cool that the CEO, President CEO of Walmart, is, it wears his faith on his sleeve like that. Walmart is not a company I would have initially said uh, is, and they're not a Christian company, I would say, per se, but they have a very faith-based Christian leader, uh, which is awesome that he's instilling those values and he's bold enough to go on camera uh, and say this, uh, the sort of things he did, the, he did there. Excuse me. Uh, the Pizza Ranch, one of our clients, and honestly, a company that's been pretty impactful on the formation of our own faith family work culture at Click Crane. I remember, is there any Pizza Ranch people here? No, Pizza Ranch people. Um, in 2010 or 11, I got the opportunity to hear Adrian Grunewag, the founder of Pizza Ranch, talk about when he rolled out to their franchisees this vision statement. And he was nervous as heck. He's like, I'm going to get up on stage in front of all our franchisees, and we're going to kind of pivot the company a little bit, and we're going to put God in our vision statement. And he did it. And Pizza Ranch has followed that uh, ever since. You own a Pizza Ranch, you're Christian music. Pizza Ranch is a great organization. They put God in their vision statement, and their vision statement to glorify God by positively impacting the world. It says nothing about roasted chicken, or feeding people, or food, or fun. To glorify God by positively impacting the world. Whew, that's quite a vision statement. That's pretty bold. Um, and so they're throwing the buoy way out there with who they want to be as an organization. Uh, in and Out Burger, for the West Coasters who miss a good In and Out Burger, 
Uh, in and out Burger is another uh, great example of a company that, in a subtle way, um, tries to wear their faith on their sleeve a little bit by on the bottom of their cups, the bottom of their bags, printing Bible verses. Not the verse itself, just where it's found, which also encourages, uh, I can tell you what I did after I found this picture. I went to Revelation 3.20 because I didn't know what that was. So encouraged a little bit of uh, work on my part, which was kind of fun. Um, a local company, and, and Dan is here today actually, uh, but, but C. Lemmy Companies, uh, I've gotten to know Dan uh, through a board I'm on called the Kingdom Capital Fund. And the uh, um, first time I met Dan, I'm like, what's, the, what's with this C. Lemmy? Is that your wife's name or your dog? Or are you like C. Daniel? Or how does this, how does this work? And he's like, no, it's, uh, the C stands for Christ. Because I put Christ first in my business. Yeah, everybody, they're like, wow. What a door opening. What a door opener. Because I'm sure everybody asks that. Everybody asks me, where'd click rain come from? That's too late. I can't change it to C dash lick rain anymore. <laughs> but, um, but what a great door opener for a conversation, you know. Um, also, Mike and Tad with, with Adams Thermal are here as well. Adams Thermal out of Canton, a um, company that is using God's resources, uh, financially and otherwise to bless the kingdom. They started Adam's Thermal Foundation, have given away several million dollars to causes uh, locally, nationally, but uh, they have a big international focus. They've taken over the operation of a couple schools in Ethiopia uh, and are doing some amazing things with the schools there. Uh, I'd encourage you to just Google Adam's Thermal Foundation and see what they're doing, but that's a great example of a company that said, hey, God's the CEO of our company. We're gonna tithe from the top of our sales. They do that. They take a top of uh, a chunk of their sales, not profits, sales, top line revenue, push that over to the foundation. Their foundation is doing great things to, to bless the world. Uh, and then on a local level, you'll see these a lot, okay? Um, I think Obed is here, right? Was he? We invited him. Oh, bummer. Well, anyway, I took a picture of his sign last week. I came across his sign. I'm like, this guy's got primo placement on Minnesota Avenue. To, to, you know, to pimp his car insurance rates or whatever. <laughs> and he's using it, he's using it for this. I'm like, what a good dude. So I took a picture of it and I'm like, oh, this is neat. Cliff Avenue upholstery, that's the other one I always think of. When you go down Cliff, you guys know what I'm talking about. If you're local, that's the, the guy on Cliff Avenue. One day I just brought the guy donuts and juice. I'm like, hey, I'm just bringing you these because I think it's cool you use your sign for Bible verses and stuff. So eat some donuts, man, this is cool. <laughs> But there's, there's also organizations uh, for many, many years, 36 years, Alaska Airlines, Bible verses on the trays of, for the first class passengers. Uh, and then in 2006, uh, they pulled that back. Uh, they pulled that back and they said, uh, we believe it's the right thing to do in order to respect the diverse religious beliefs and cultural attitudes of our customers and employees. So, um, not judging in any way, but again, Scripture does not say be bold when it doesn't offend. But if it does offend, don't be bold. Scripture says to be bold. Be bold in your faith. Um, obviously still a great company that they did this for 36 years. Wish they were still doing it today. So where I want to spend uh, the, the most time today and the rest of our time together is talking about this. It's like, you can do this. So, what does it mean to, how can I, what are some tangible ways that I can work God into my company, okay? How, how did you do this, Paul? Or how did Dan do this? Or how did Mike Adams do this? How do, how do you guys do this? Um, and when we first started at ClickRain, when it was just me and the other guy, and Randy's like, what sort of culture are we building here? I'm like, well, I went to Amazon, I Googled Christian business devotionals, and this was the first one, I'm like, oh, I'll buy it. So I bought it. And we'd read this together on Mondays. And it was a little awkward, because it was just me and him. Um, <laughs> and he was like, all right, Paul, can we, we go now? I got an AdWords campaign I got to work on. But uh, we started by doing that. And quite honestly, I was saying, OK, check. Got God in the workplace. We read this little devotional on Monday. Check that box. Now let's go make the donuts and get rich. And it, it's not like that. It's not, a, it's not a thing you just check off. It's done. It has to be woven in. And so after that last trip, 
when I met the lady with the abscess, or didn't meet the lady with the abscess tooth. I came back from that trip, and at the time I was, I was um, have, reading through a book with my friend Heath Oberlo, um, and it was, it's called The Hole in Our Gospel. If you haven't read the book, probably the most powerful book I've ever read. And I said, Heath, we gotta do something because I'm, I'm back here worried about growing a business and building websites and making money and getting on the Inc. 5000 list. And there's people who can't get out of bed because they don't have 70 bucks to get their tooth pulled. People gotta see this. People gotta see what's going on outside of our Heather Ridge, Minnesota, Cliff Avenue bubble that we all live in. And so we started a nonprofit. Heath and I started a nonprofit called The Dispatch Project. And we, we now organize international mission trips for businesses. So we approach a business and we say, hey, XYZ business, we're going to Haiti next spring. We want you to send one of your employees with us. And preferably you'd comp some of their PTO or pay some of their way or do both, because that employee's gonna come back and share that perspective at work and be on fire at their work. And they're gonna have a different perspective on what they make, on their marriage, on the amazing meal you all just ate, um, the waste we're gonna throw away, you know, from what didn't get eaten, your perspective just changes tremendously. Um, and so it was at that time, coming back from that trip, also decided that faith family work was going to be a mantra. That we were gonna just, we were gonna use it a lot at our company. We were gonna drive this mantra home. And you saw it in some of those survey results that our, our team, they mentioned that a lot. And what we mean by that is, this should be your priority order in life. As soon as this priority order gets out of whack, you're gonna have some problems. Faith, family, work needs to be your priority. And it was at that time we also started what we called our atmosphere team. Our atmosphere team is strictly responsible for ensuring that a faith, family, work culture stays present in our company. Okay, it's four or five people that uh, organize uh, outings that we do for uh, kingdom purposes, whether that's volunteering, organize Bible studies, organize things in the office that ensure that God remains visible and present in our office, which is part of our, our mission statement, which is, we strive to honor and glorify God's name by providing innovative technology solutions to clients nationwide. Okay? Uh, the first part of that is what's most, we strive to honor and glorify God's name by uh, the market we're in or the space we're in in digital could dry up tomorrow and we could manufacture podiums. And this first part would stay the same and then by making the best podiums you've ever seen, okay? <laughs> so that would never, that never changes. And that never changes from a personal mission statement as well. You have a personal mission statement. You should have that. It's like I seek to impact the world or to impact the workplace by doing this. My current vocation is as the CEO of ClickRain. I'm not gonna do that forever, I can tell you that. Um, but that's, that's my mission field right now. Two years from now, I may be a landscaper, but my personal mission statement hasn't changed. I'm just, in my mission field's different. And so what I see is a lot of organizations working to evolve their culture, moving from culture 1.0. So when, when we talk culture, and it's such an overused term, I, it's, it's been watered down tremendously, but people instantly think of things like this when you think culture. Casual dress, you know, food, ping pong table, uh, we have a company picnic, we have good benefits. That's not a culture. Those are just perks. Those are benefits. That is not a culture. Culture isn't something you can just bullet list out. Well, then I see some organizations, and us included, ClickRain, well, we try to involve that further. We say, well, we provide team yoga once a month, and we, we take company trips, and we provide free sports tickets, and we're taking it up a level. We're spending even more on our people. Those are still just perks, and they're still just benefits. Where the culture really starts to become a culture is when you have things that you're doing that aren't perks. They're just part of the DNA of the organization. So. Having a company Bible study, I guess you could say that's a perk. You probably wouldn't list that as a benefit, but that's just something that happens. That's something Paul just did. It's part of the culture, man. You know, we pray before our executive meetings. We pray before, we pray after. For God to just let the decisions we make today be your decisions, not our decisions. Um, we recently started with this. Uh, I know Adam Thermal does this. I know Tyson Foods has chaplains they have on staff. And actually, just you walk the floor. 
talk with people, pull them into the offices, chat with them about life, works, faith. Um, through an organization called Corporate Care, we now have a, a workplace chaplaincy program uh, who are employees, you know, if they got something on their mind, they can meet with this chaplain and just kind of get it off their chest. And it can be spiritual, it can be, hey, I'm having something going on at home. Uh, this is where culture starts to really be faith, family, work. If you really do say that, you have to act on that as an organization. You can't just say, God is my CEO, and then not equip people and show uh, that God truly is the CEO. So, well, we do some things, you know, in the community and volunteer and stuff like that. And a lot of organizations, uh, your organization will do this. You volunteer at the banquet or the mission or you rake people's lawns or whatever. Um, about three years ago, we made um, a decision that we were going to set a pretty big sales goal as a company. And we threw, we, we, we threw the buoy way out there. We're like, we'll never swim to that, but it will motivate the team. And, so we threw it out there, they swam all the way to it, passed it, and the reward was a trip to Cancun for everybody. And we're like, they'll never get there. Well, they got there, and they're like, oh crap. <laughs> no, they didn't. So, I guess we gotta do this. So we did this, and we had a blast. Uh, we went for uh, three or four nights, and spouses came, and this and that, and we truly had fun. Uh, but, and, and let me preface this, we had just the greatest team ever, but they weren't super appreciative of the trip. I mean, there wasn't a lot of handwritten thank yous to management or uh, you know, even some, a lot of verbal thank yous. It was almost like, well, oh, that was fun. But it didn't really, wasn't super appreciated. And so it kind of bothered me a little bit. At first I was ticked, you know. <laughs> I'm like, dude, we just dropped some fat coin on this trip. And, then uh, I started to realize that what people really want isn't necessarily trips to Cancun. Those, those are good, and we still take trips, um, but we, we offer a benefit whereby our people get to go on international, these mission trips through the Dispatch Project, uh, and they get an extra week of PTO every year to take on a mission trip, and the company pays for half of their costs to go on these mission trips. And, um, Brady's always real popular with the kids when he, when he goes here. <laughs> but we, we go to a deaf village in Jamaica. We go to the uh, Dominican, Guatemala, Haiti, um, Nicaragua. And I tell you what, man, the impact that those trips have on the team versus taking them to Cancun for four days, night and day difference. Night and day difference. I mean, if I had two grand to send someone on a trip, um, and it was this business conference in Vegas about digital marketing, or it was, you're gonna go to Haiti and work at a deaf village for a week. I, it's Haiti, every time. Because the, uh, the impact it has on them as a person. And I get notes back, or I get emails back, or uh, our team, our leadership team, gets <laughs> thank yous upon thank yous. Um, when people leave our company, what they always reference is Thank you for letting me go on that trip to such and such. It was so impactful to me. That's the one thing they reference. Uh, and so named our conference room after these places where we go. So we have, uh, you know, we send out a meeting invite to a client, say, hey, we're meeting in Jamaica at nine o'clock. And, <laughs> and, and it's, it's, it's somewhat funny, but it also opens the doors for them to say, like, what, what is, why is this called Jamaica? Well, we actually, we go there on service trips. Really? What, what's that about? opens a door, a little door opener for a conversation. Um, several years ago, we actually took this faith family work mantra and we just, we wrote a little book about it and we had all our employees, if they wanted, contribute to it, contribute a chapter. What does faith family work mean to you? Uh, and we were able to give this book out and distribute it. Uh, and that was a really neat team building experience to do. And, um, but the, I am not a prosperity theology guy. Don't even, accuse me of that, but I am a data guy, and I, I look at numbers, and I know that we put God in our mission statement in 2011, it's like we gotta put God in our mission statement. And 2011 came back from that trip to the Dominican Republic and said we gotta, we gotta make some changes here. Um, we need to start giving more money away, okay? We need to start uh, investing in our people more. We need to have a faith family work mantra. Um, and God has blessed the company. He, God is looking at all of us as business owners as his money managers. 
You hire a money manager because you want that money manager, hey, grow my money, man. But remember, it's my money. Same thing with God. He's like, grow my money, Paul. But remember, it's my money. So we're growing it. What we do with it then is a great responsibility. Great responsibility. Does anyone know, by show of hands, who Colonel Thomas Brown is? I'm just curious. No one. Well, I told you the story earlier this week. <laughs> one guy who I told this story to, Steve Larson. So Colonel Thomas Brown was a big deal in Sioux Falls back in the day. A big, big deal. Uh, he organized the first frame dwelling in Sioux Falls. The first frame dwelling at Phillips and 12th. Even before C. Lemmy was putting up stuff, this guy was putting up a frame dwelling. Helped secure Burlington, Cedar Rapids, Northern Railroads for Sioux Falls. He was instrumental in getting the railroads here. He was one of the most prominent Masons in the whole state. Okay? He was the first chairman of the local school board. He was the first Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of the Dakota Territory. And I don't care who you are. If you're a Grand Master, you are something. He organized the Properties Association uh, to improve Phillips, organized the first paving of Phillips Avenue. And he owned s lots of businesses, including a book business with Eugene Sanger, okay, Brown, Brown Sanger, name still lives on in that business, right? So as I'm researching this guy uh, and thinking about the impact he had, and I wonder if he was a Christian and all this, I went to Mount Pleasant Cemetery a couple weeks ago to find his grave. And here's this grave. Got the family plot and Thomas H. Brown, first Grand Master of the Dakota Territory. Okay? Born, died, the dash. And I'm like, man, he ended up like exactly how I'm going to end up. And he was the biggest of big deals back in the day. And honestly, none of that stuff he did lives on. His name's still on a business. None of you have even heard of him. The only thing that matters is the impact he had on those people and the people that he had influence over um, in bringing them to Christ. That's the only thing that's, that's everlasting. Um, and so, if you want to do a fun exercise, craft your own epitaph like this. Craft your own tombstone. And there was a day, and this is today, and it's, if you really just want to get real, today could be the day. And think of it that way. And there was a day when I was working hard for a tombstone that would read like this. Talented entrepreneur who earned unwavering respect from his peers, visionary leader, and retired a wealthy man. And I think deep down, there's still parts of me that struggles with all those and still wants all those. Um, where I want to get, and I am far from getting there, is I would love for it to say nothing about business or nothing about wealth or nothing about money or entrepreneurship or digital or whatever it is. Thomas Brown, first Grand Master of uh, the Dakota Lodge. That's the legacy on his tombstone. Does anyone even know what that means? You know, it's, it's tough when you think of it like that, the legacy you're leaving. And you have to live each day and the impact you have on your company as if it could be the last day. And what, what impact am I having on my employees, my staff, my clients, my vendors? So think of your company in the same way. Okay? If your company goes under today and it's done, what's the legacy of your company? Colonel Brown had the, uh, has the luxury of his company lived on. How cool is that? His company's lived on to today. It's still a great company today. Most of us, our businesses, they're not going to be around in 100 years, you know? We aren't going to have our name on the sign 100 years from now. Um, so if we're done today, there was a day when we wanted to be a regional leader in marketing, technology, digital, interactive solution. <laughs> Who cares? It's important. It's, a vo it's our vocation. Um, but more importantly, I would love, love, love for someday, for, if someone would say this about us, and there's a and there's a breakfast in this room in 50 years, and be like, anyone heard of Click Rain? And they'd be like, yeah, I have. What do you know about him? And have him say this. That's a legacy, because you know the impact you had on your people. Um, putting God CEO. So 
In closing, I want to leave you with a few resources. So these resources have been very valuable to me um, in helping with this mission. Uh, first one is, it's a book called God's, God's Givers by Will Stevens. Will is here, so Will, you can stand up and wave. He's the guy with the long hair. <laughs> uh, Will is with uh, a ministry called Waterstone, and Waterstone helps business owners, people who have realized worldly success, financial success, use that success for kingdom purposes. Complex assets, helping unwind those. Uh, he works a lot with our Kingdom Capital Fund Board uh, in some of our projects that we have. He's a great guy. Uh, he's got free copies of his book on the back, and he's going to be back there as well. So take a copy of Will's book. Second, um, the Journey Group. This was started by Randy Reese, and uh, <sighs> this. Come on, Paul. This uh, study had a, a big impact. Susan, his, his widow, is here. I just saw you as I started talking about Randy, so I'm sorry. Vantage Point 3, the Journey Group, Google that. Um, it's a great study. Um, TGIF, excuse me before I go ahead, TGIF, Oz Hillman, it's a, devotion, it's a daily devotional that I get about business uh, and faith in the workplace. It's really good. It's really, really good. Um, share those with my team. A lot of times we'll read those on a Monday uh, at our staff meetings. Um, very powerful. And the last, self-serving link, that's the Dispatch Project. That's our website. If any of you want to go on a service trip overseas, and meet a lady with a bad tooth that you could fix in 30 minutes. Um, and I say that jokingly, but I mean that seriously. It's impactful. Uh, so check out our website or talk to me about that. And, and then lastly, we actually contacted um, the Halftime Institute. Bob Buford wrote a book called Halftime. Who's read Halftime in this room? All right, a few of you. A unbelievable book. Not all of you are at Halftime. But basically the premise of Halftime is uh, for me, I'm 39, I'll be 40 in November. And so, I'm knocking on halftime. In fact, I may be in the ninth inning with two outs. I don't know. But the goal is the first half of the life, my life, was focused on success. Money, um, work, growth, branding, power. Um, Bob Buford challenges you to think about what's the second half look like and how do you move from success to significance? And I know that most people who have read this book have made some pretty life-changing decisions because of it. So don't read it unless you're ready to be gripped by the Holy Spirit. And we have free copies of this book. Bob Buford, they sell this on Amazon. This is a, this is a New York Times bestseller, and they're like, yeah, we'll send you 300 copies at 20 bucks a pop. So take one if you're going to read it, but only take it if you're going to read it. Will's read it. Will was a Wall Street executive, and, and now he's, uh, he's with a ministry. So you talk about halftime. We moved from success to significance. Powerful book. So uh, I'd like to invite up um, Dan Lemmy, actually, with, uh, with C. Lemmy Companies. Dan is going to close in prayer for us today. Uh, I, I contacted him at the time and asked if he would do this. And, and while Dan is coming up here, come on up, Dan. Um, I had to kind of work hard to make sure Dan would be here because um, I've known Dan for a few years, and, and he's, he's just a... He's a guy that I've really enjoyed getting to know as a, as a Christian man of, of, of Christ and a strong business owner. And um, as we potentially look at, do we do more God as CEO events or what's the appetite for this in the marketplace? We wanted to actually recognize a business um, that uh, puts God in the, in the corner office. Uh, and Dan embodies that in a lot of ways. And so, Dan, we'd like to give you the uh, God as CEO award for this oh, year. Thank you. And uh, I would love if you would just join me in honoring Dan. Thank you so much, Paul. God bless you. Thank you for coming. And, and now I have to make him pray. So, <laughs> Dan, it's yours. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to Paul for doing this. Um, you know, everybody here in this room is, is really special because you've gathered in Christ's name. And when you use 
the name of Christ, Jesus Christ, um, you, what you're doing is you're pleasing Him very, very much. He loves to hear His name. He loves it when we gather uh, in His name. Um, so when you guys are doing this, you're in, in worship. You're worshiping Christ. So um, I, I used to tell my kids every day when they were going out the door, I always said, be good, do good, and serve the Lord. Uh, they're, they're all moved out of the house and everything now, and they come back home for Christmas or whatever, and they're walking out the door, and I says, uh, what, what do we say? She says, I know, Dad. It's like, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so bring up his name often everywhere you go, all right? Uh, throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout your life, uh, always bring up his name, and, uh, and you're worshiping God, okay? Let's close with a word of prayer. Thanks again, Paul. <laughs> Dear Heavenly and Gracious Father, we just thank you so much for uh, this day. We thank you for uh, the ability to gather in your name. We thank you so much for choosing us, dear Lord. We ask that you would um, walk with us and be with us in, in all and everything that we do. And we just uh, thank you and we love you, dear Lord. And uh, just uh, in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. So, much, <laughs> so um, we're going to send you guys out an email with a little survey to see if, like I said, if, if there's an appetite to do more of these sorts of events in the future in our, in our marketplace. Um, but I want to thank you all for attending, and uh, go in peace. Thank you.